thank you very much. Those are kind words. I actually would like to meet the person you were speaking about. Uh, <laughs> sounds pretty interesting. Um, uh, please bear with me a little bit. I, uh, I have a, a, a number of children also still in school, and the fall season brings many things, uh, opportunities to learn, opportunities to share ideas, and opportunities to share viruses, uh, even with your parents. Uh, so I'm number five in my family. It was holding out until yesterday. But uh, if the rambling is too bad, then blame the virus. Uh, don't blame uh, me. Um, on a more serious note, uh, I think one thing we can say uh, with certainty is that the world is changing. Um, and I really don't know when in history someone couldn't stand similarly in front of any other audience and say the world is changing. It's, it's always that way, but it certainly is that way today as well. What was uh, not so long ago uh, a bipolar world with certainties, if not pleasantries all around, is absolutely not the case. Uh, we are in a quite large state of flux, also politically, where we have what we tend to call waves of populism or waves of unhappiness among voters that choose, uh, depending upon the country, more or less uh, parties that are offering, at least in their offer, quite radically different views of how governance uh, should occur. We have parts of the world that uh, cause a great consternation uh, uh, that not necessarily all citizens understand why they should be concerned. And if we think about European concerns, of course, as the Prime Minister of Latvia, I will, and I will speak about Russia, uh, and that's the obvious uh, 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 cause of concern. But we also have a serious cause of concern for years of what is happening in Syria, uh, because the ongoing uh, civil war in Syria has been one of the main causes of uh, social unrest in Europe because of the mass amounts of uh, migration, refugees coming from that country. And what we've been following in the last few days of new offensives, uh, this time coming from Turkey into the north of Syria, means potentially more displaced people, which means potentially, in the long run, more people who could end up looking for a new home on our shores. And this is a big challenge uh, for European uh, security. It's a big challenge uh, for European politics and for governments all around. So it's something that is happening now that could have quite broad ramifications uh, all around. And I think that no one really is set to answer uh, what that means and, and are we really ready uh, to handle that. Um, the kinds of threats in the world are also rather different. So, uh, as was stated, I grew up in the United States in the 1970s. We used to have school drills where we would be taught how to crouch underneath of our desks or if we were in the hallway to crouch up against uh, the hallway wall uh, in case the Soviet Union launched a nuclear attack. I never fully understood how my desk would save me in case of nuclear attack, but I dutifully learned to crouch quickly when I heard the right bell. And of course, my uh, now friends and colleagues in Latvia were undergoing similar kinds of uh, drills uh, within the broad auspices of the Soviet Union, waiting for the Americans uh, to attack them. Um, a potentially devastating military threat that was staved off only because of the tremendously unimaginable negative consequences if a nuclear war ever came out. So sort of a self-deterring uh, uh, system with a threat so large that no one dared uh, even imagine letting it happen. But uh, military threats, uh, of course, uh, still exist. Uh, Latvia uh, uh, bases its uh, military uh, security strategy on the broad NATO uh, framework. And uh, the EU is going through uh, motions of looking how we can better coordinate our security and defense policy. Uh, my view is that it's very good if in the EU we can 
become more coordinated, certainly on, uh, say, purchasing agreements, uh, certain levels of coordination could bring our taxpayers uh, uh, relief because we could uh, more cleverly utilize uh, the same amount of money. But it's important that any kind of coordination or strengthening within the European Union happens in conjunction with NATO as a whole. So the European Union, as, or many European Union member states, as a strong and coherent part of NATO, but in no way as a challenge or an alternative to NATO, but as an integral part of NATO. But the military threat is only one of the threats these days. Uh, we have uh, now in all of our pockets here, I'm certain, at least one mobile device, a telephone or a tablet or both or two telephones. Uh, cybersecurity is a very real threat. So people think of cybersecurity, is my phone being hacked? Uh, maybe it is. But uh, in terms of society, the real concerns uh, in terms of safety are, what about the electric grid? What about the information systems of our healthcare systems? Uh, uh, what about uh, communications as such, not only government communications, but all uh, communications? There is a potential of doing massive amounts of disruption in an economy without having one boot on the ground or one plane in the air. Just a bunch of people sitting in a room thousands of kilometers away, uh, moving their 10 fingers or two uh, very rapidly uh, and uh, causing uh, havoc. Uh, so this is a kind of defense that is being developed and we need to keep our guard up uh, there as well. Uh, then we have another threat that we in Latvia have been living with for a long time. Uh, it is the threat of disinformation. Uh, for years, as a frontline country uh, on a border with Russia, we have explained to our colleagues in the EU and in NATO that this is a very real threat because what disinformation's goal is to divide society. And you don't have to choose. This is the beauty of being offensive in a disinformation war. You don't have to choose the topic, the topic chooses itself. So let's say it's vaccination. What does vaccination have to do with safety? Well, plenty, because people uh, uh, in a society, if they are united, they are strong. If they're divided, they are weaker. So all you have to look for is potential dividing lines and strengthen them. So with vaccination, we see a fantastic story, a narrative coming out of Russia for years on a long ago debunked uh, argument that uh, uh, vaccination of children causes autism. It is complete ridiculousness, yet the story lives and is propagated and lives again and causes people to be uh, wary of vaccinating their children, and the end result, we are now seeing diseases that we thought were eradicated long before I was born. They're coming back because there's a level of vaccination in any society, apparently around 80, 85 percent, that if that percentage is immunized, the remaining 15 percent actually are covered. But if that percentage goes low, it's a problem. A good example of the kind of disinformation that can be brought. A more insidious, perhaps, uh, deals in the realm of politics. And Europe has the central powers, so the, the central party is the center left and the center right, uh, the conservatives and the socialists, broadly speaking, the liberals and the greens, also falling within that broad family of centrist parties. And then we have, outside of these centrist parties, what could be broadly spoken, the, the hard left and the hard right. Uh, and, uh, these parties around Europe have received all kinds of aid, also financial, from Russia, not because of their distinct ideology, but because of their commonality that they are opposed to the status quo. So you can fund the hard left or the far, far right. It's not a contradiction because your goal is not ideological left or right. Your goal is to divide. So divide and rule is a very old military tactic. There are plenty of military people in the room. Uh, you can do that on the battlefield. 
it costs uh, potentially lives, or you can do it in the field of information. Make your opponent weak from within. How clever. Now, we uh, in, in Latvia, we have the NATO uh, uh, Strategic Communication Center of Excellence, uh, which I think is doing a great job. Uh, it has been acknowledged that we really have to understand this threat, accept that it is a threat, in order to counter that threat. And we will continue in our country uh, to be the leaders uh, in this role. Very pleased that it is now broadly acknowledged that it really is a problem, but it is another kind of threat. So we've looked at a military threat, we've looked at uh, the cybersecurity threat, and we've uh, talked about uh, the information uh, environment. Uh, and there's another kind of threat, uh, and that is a threat uh, to our financial sector, the banks. So how can you weaken banks and trust in banks? Well, you undermine the banks. Uh, how do you do it, and how has it been done for apparently a good number of years, is through money laundering. You launder money through banks, that's the name of the game, that's if you're a criminal or a destructively minded individual or government. Uh, and it has a number of advantages to those doing the laundering. Uh, if it works, you have money at the end that you can use to corrupt politicians and cause problems in this way. Uh, and if it's uncovered, over time, which this is the beauty of truth, it tends to come out sooner or later, you create instability in the system, doubt. Doubt is what those who want to divide us feed upon. They want us to doubt our politicians, to doubt our institutions, including doubting our banks. So what's important for us is in the fight against money laundering to understand that it coincidentally attracts both the common criminal and the very highly organized criminal. In Europe, what we see in our country is you cannot go it alone. So we can, in Latvia, and we are in the process of doing it, completely revamping, revamping the bank uh, oversight institution. Starting with the laws and the procedures, we're now in the process, the government has approved, we're waiting for a parliamentary vote on the new head of the FCMC, the bank watchdog. But if we succeed, and I hope we do, in squeezing out all dirty money from our system, does that mean the money disappears? It's a little bit like living in an apartment block and you have a problem with cockroaches. So you can, I don't know what you, you know, you spray or you do incantations or you use peppers, but you get rid of your cockroaches, but they just go to your neighbor's uh, apartment. Uh, so then your neighbor has to do it. And actually, you have to get rid of, you have to do the sanitation for the entire building. It's the same with money laundering. It's not enough that one country pushes the problem out of its borders. The problem doesn't go away. We need to get the money out of Europe. And the only way we can successfully do that is through more centralized coordination. Because money laundering is all about understanding, evaluating, and countering risk in the financial sector. But risk, as anyone in the military circles knows, can be interpreted quite differently in different circumstances. So is a transaction coming from Russia risky? Well, if you ask a Latvian banker, you'll get one answer. If you ask a German banker, you may get another answer. If you ask a Portuguese banker, you may get yet a third answer. But the truth is always the same. It is risky, potentially which means you need to have certain safeguards and questions to know your customer to make sure that, that the, the, the dirty money doesn't get in. But the realization of the Latvian banker and the realization of the Portuguese banker needs to be quite similar. Otherwise, the system is compromised, not through the front door of Latvia, but through the back door of Portugal. So if we think about our security and the changing world, we have to think about military threats and counter those military threats. We have to think about cybersecurity threats and counter those threats, about informational uh, threats and counter those threats as well, and of course also in uh, the uh, uh, financial sector. And finally, what we've realized in Latvia is that because of the changed nature of the threat, we have to change ourselves actually even further. 
So it's not enough to say, we want to feel secure, so we pay for our defense. We're in, in, investing now for a number of years, 2%. Uh, We're looking to go above 2% of our GDP. Uh, wonderfully modernizing uh, 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 armed forces. I'm extremely proud of our men and women uh, who are uh, actively engaged in our country's uh, security. But we cannot outsource our security only to the military. Well, then you think, okay, well, then there's internal, so it's the police. Uh, yes, of course, it's the police. But it's not also not the police. And what we've realized is that we need all of society to be engaged in our defense. So we're in, uh, starting to enact what we call a comprehensive defense system, down to the household level, where people would know, for example, what kind of food uh, uh, stores they should have at any given time in their home, in case of not only a military threat, but say a natural disaster, something that takes out a large part of the electricity grid. It happened in 2000. Five. Uh, uh, we lost 60% of our power. There was basically a hurricane that came through the north of Europe, rather rare, maybe with uh, climate change uh, potentially an ever-growing threat. So if all of society is ready and knows what to do in case of an uh, uh, unforeseen uh, circumstance, that lowers the risk of panic. And lowering the risk of panic and making, making sure everyone knows their place means the military can do what the military has to do. The uh, uh, internal security forces can do what they have to do. Companies can do what they have to do. So we have all kinds of um, um, equipment that could be used to, you know, to cut trees or to, to help fix power lines, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. So to sum up, the world is changing. Nothing new about that. But we as societies have to be ahead of the curve. You never know what's coming, but you certainly can be ready. I, I've, I, I, one of the ways I, I like to relax is I try to travel to schools around my country. I highly advise anyone to do this. When you feel a little tired, visit a school. Kids in our country, I'm sure in all of your countries, they're fantastic. They're positive, they're full of energy, they're full of optimism. It's, it's, it's that which we have to be reminded of, how important it is. But I sometimes ask them a rhetorical question. Imagine a football field uh, on, on the pitch. And uh, it's the defenders, and there's two defenders. Uh, and there's the goalkeeper, two defenders, and, and the ball is coming down the field towards the goal. Now imagine one of the defenders standing the way I'll now stand. So I am now a defender on a football pitch during a game. OK, I, I crossed my arms and one leg was out. Now I will be the other defender on the same football pitch, in the same moment, in the same game. My, my eyes were a little weird. My, my knees were bent. Uh, I was moving. And the rhetorical question is, who will get the ball? Well, obviously, the guy who was already moving, not the guy who had his arms crossed. We have to think this way in our security. At all levels, let's be the guy moving, not the guy with his arms crossed. Thank you very much.